Well, hi everyone. Welcome back to another edition of Speed Tips by Bob and Chad. Um, what Chad, we just came off of a big week out at the Super Nationals in, at Boone Speedway in, in Boone, Iowa. Uh, so Chad and I got to spend the whole well, eight days probably or seven days, something like that. And uh, yeah, you got there on Sunday, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it was seven days in. And uh, quite the event. What's your thoughts, Chad? Yeah, it was uh, <clears throat> just a, an awesome week, man. It's such a, it, you know, you almost can't even put it into words. It's the way they run it. It's such a smooth operation and so many great people there and so many cars. And, you know, uh, a little bit of rain shower Saturday morning to try and ruin it. And they adjusted the schedule beautifully to, to, you know, get it done accordingly and, and have time to get the show in Saturday night. And, you know, we had a, we had a really good week ourselves and got to debut the new products and, and uh, see all the great people and customers and, and all our friends and hang out with all of our fellow manufacturers. We've turned it into quite a deal there on, on manufacturers row. Like you said, we're there eight days and, you know, uh, we got chef Ben and, uh, yeah. you know, brought lasagna now this year so yeah. we have a lot of fun we have a lot of fun out there and and uh it's definitely a, a great time and just such an awesome event and it gives us the a great platform to to do what we did i mean that's our trade show now we don't go to pri anymore and and you know the the hardcore saturday night grassroots racer that's who we are so that's that's why we're focusing on events like the super nationals and you know we got deer creek here in a couple of weeks so we're gonna hit that pretty hard and and uh you know just an awesome week all together yeah i it's, it's, it's actually myself personally is probably one of my better super nationals because as you notice i didn't really do a whole heck of a lot um uh, the boys in the in, in the trailer man they busted their butt bobby had 113 hours last week wow and uh uh, doing shocks for people and man I tell you what I can't complain we, we sold some stuff and and we had a good week too and so but but the neat part of it is you just get to see so many of those people that that's the only time of the year you see them you know yeah. I mean, like people that come from California people that come from Arkansas or Texas um, you got to see our old buddy Larry Sanders who's on the channel here with us quite a bit and uh and I was amazed how many people even come up to me to you know watch the channel and you know thanked us for what we were doing and it was just like I said it was and the weather was perfect. I mean, granted, it definitely seemed you know the rain on Saturday kind of looked like it was going to dampen things a little bit, and, but the boys said you know hey the rain's going to quit by three o'clock and we're going to get this in and well I'll tell you what at one o'clock I'd have thought man, I think they're <laughs> they're seeing a picture I'm not seeing but it did and they did I mean that was pretty got to compliment the crew and and everybody there at Boone Speedway for getting that deal put together man and of course the infield was too muddy so they had a basically a, a, a stage uh, out there in the fan zone so that they could still celebrate the victory and and so yeah, it was a pretty cool deal. I, I was very impressed. Larry says he uh, enjoyed the week. Car didn't make it back same way as it left. Um, you know, sorry to say there is some people that had that situation. And, you know, and when you got 300 modifieds and 33 of them are going to start, so you know that's 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 10 percent of the field and. Uh, you know, it's it's a tough deal, and, and you know the way that deal is out there. You got to draw good, and, and uh, you know, and if you if you draw one of those heat races that's right after a farm, you, you know, these conditions are changing. But you know, it's just the element of the uh, of the deal. So, uh, Robert says, thanks for blessing us with all your unlimited knowledge. Greatly appreciate it. And I feel like we're old friends after 64 hours of videos. Well, I appreciate 
Robert, I appreciate you watching that many videos. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, and if everything goes good, this thing will actually go live on uh, YouTube tonight. We we think we finally got that deal so that it will stream right on YouTube tonight too. Uh, I'll know more after the tonight's over if we've got that figured out. But they they seem to think that they must have had that deal figured out. So whatever. Uh, Jason, how wealthy do you have to be to say it's all Weir's bolt-ons? Kidding. Thanks for what you guys do. Well, you know, once again, best parts made in America today. I can't say any more. There are more expensive parts than mine. We keep an eye on that. Brandon, any chance of seeing Weir's machine components on mod lights? Well, I'm quite sure if there's components to be made, I'm quite sure Chad will look into that. We have done a few J bars. Uh, we can, we actually, guys were bending. I don't know. I, I should have took more time. It was so crazy there that uh, I should have took more time and went and studied them things a little bit. But we did make a couple J bars for uh, some guys that were having trouble bending stuff. We just took our normal modified one and reduced it down to the half inch bolts and, and uh, made a concoction that worked. And, you know, they're probably a little bit too beefy for that car, but uh, you ain't never going to have a problem with it. So, but we're always, uh, we're always looking for new products and, and avenues. And uh, we have talked to a couple different of the builders and whatnot. And so we're, we're starting to take a look at that market for sure. Um, Brian says hello from Texas. Uh, Dan, have you guys ever tried zero caster on the right front with with these bar cars? Uh, absolutely not. Um, yeah, I'm still a believer that you got to have a certain amount of caster with those cars, and and of course, you know, it depends on your caster gain. I mean, if you got a lot of caster gain, you could probably start at zero and see where it goes. But but I, I've never tried zero caster. Uh, I would be skeptical of how that would work. Uh, let's see here. Question. IMCA, IMCA Sport Mod. Keep busting off the snap ring on the left front upper A arm, front, the front snap ring. I've been through several new upper A arms and it still busts off, and the arm stretches out 0.75 inches and it causes a straight push into the wall. Well, I don't know what, I mean, that, there's got to be a buying someplace, some, something's buying in somewhere is, is what I would lead to believe. And I'm not as familiar with the Southern Sport Mod front end geometry because it's, it's pretty much stock is what I'm understanding. Yeah, I don't know who manufactured the upper, but maybe they have a snap ring depth issue. I know we've. Uh, we've had a couple times where we had our snap ring grooves got off on a, on a different component and then the snap rings pop out. So uh, might want to go to the manufacturer and just say, hey, we had this problem and, and have them analyze the situation. I mean, anytime coming from a manufacturer's standpoint, if, you know, if there's ever a problem with our products, we need to know it from the customer so we can fix it and make it better. And I'm sure that whoever made that control arm would like to know that there was an issue so they can get in front of it and, and fix the problem. And Brandon, who's the uh, mini modified car, specifically looking for pinion and frame climber brackets for the Panard bar. Yeah, that's that's something that the uh, the other people that we were working with are talking about too. So that's just stuff that I just need dimensions and and need to know uh, you know everything that's going on, and then we can certainly take a look at it. I don't know who builds the car you have or whatnot, but. Uh, like I said, we're looking, we'll, we, we're willing to look at anything. So they're definitely a cool class. Um, Robert says, I recently bought a 2011 Skyrocket 8 car with Chevelle stub and converted it into an Eldora stock car. When I bought it, it had weird two and a half inch drop cups on the front springs. Should I switch them? Or should I switch it to just the right front drop cup? 
Well, nor normally that's what we do is just run the drop cup if you you know if you're wanting to uh, you know take care of the spring table issue. I, I I would recommend that. Yeah, I mean the other thing is that you, you know if you're at Eldora and you're going that fast and you know you got the banking to smash the right front, you probably don't need the spring table change. So maybe it would be beneficial to have both so the car falls uh, more evenly. Uh, so. I, I'm kind of torn on that. It's such a fast track. If that's the only, if that's the only place you run, you know, but if you go to a short track other than Eldora and not it's banked, then I would definitely change that left front cup and get the spring table in your favor to get the car rolling over. But if Eldora is the only place you run, I think, you know, either two top bearing cups or two drop wouldn't be terrible. All right. No, that makes sense. I, I would agree with that. Uh, Larry wants to know if you can lock the four bar bird cages up to run or modify it as a two link car. Um, you can, it wouldn't be legal in IMCA. Um, you know, they wouldn't allow that, those cages being locked up. You know, you'd have to have specific brackets. Um, Michael, we have a we have four hobby stocks out here in New York on a third mile high bank, about 18 degrees. We have BHE all the way around, running a thousand pound right front and 900 pound or a thousand pound right front and a 900 pound right front. So one of them has got to be a left front. And we have blown four right front shocks. This week we put a brand new front spring in and blew the right front 3700 pound car and 11 inch springs wow well i don't know what to tell you about why you're blowing the shocks that just makes absolutely no sense whatsoever um, you know, unless we you know, need to you know go a lot stiffer on compression just because of the the heavy weight of the car, um, you know, that would be something that, you know, I definitely, uh, Michael, I'd definitely give Bobby a call and talk to him about it and explain to him the 3,700 pound car and see what his thoughts are. I mean, the spring rate for a 3,700 pound car sounds a little soft. So it would almost lead me to believe that you could be bottoming out the shock, which would blow it all apart. Um, you want to check your travel on that to make sure you're not topping out the shock or bottoming out the shock. Well, you wouldn't you wouldn't top out the shock, you'd bottom it out. Uh, Robert says it rolls over great. Awesome. Todd, right, what? what? I'd probably leave the spring cups then. Yeah, I would probably leave the spring cups. Yep, you're right. Um, Todd, Northern Sport Mod, dry slick, too much heat in the right rear, blistering it. How do I get rear tires closer to tire temperature? Well, I mean, it would lead me to believe, Todd, that the, the, the left is a lot cooler. That would lead me to believe that and maybe the fuel cell is pretty high. Uh, cars roll on the right rear a lot. You maybe need to increase your left side percentage so that there's more load on that left rear tire. Um, you know, a lot of it could be if, if you're sliding the tire, it's going to create heat. So if the car is pretty free, um, that that's another thing that can cause a lot of right rear heat. So um, Try tightening it up, you know, maybe a little bit more jape or a little more panard bar angle in it, but uh, putting a little bit more left rear bite in it. But I, I would, I would seriously consider a little bit more left side percentage. You know, up it up to, if you're at 54 with the driver, go up to 55, 55 and a half, and see because it sounds like the car is rolling a lot. It would be anytime I see that higher to do that situation the car's rolling on the right rear quite a bit. Uh, Jerry and Steve. Steve is watching. Awesome. Our old buddy Pat, not meaning to pick on Barnum and Bailey Circus, but I think we are 
all just witnessed the greatest show on earth. Good seeing you all. Thanks for a great week. See you guys soon. Well, we had a good time, Pat. Had a good chat with you there on Saturday while we're watching the rain or thinking about what it's going to do for rain. And uh, uh, so it was very good. Had, had a great time. Uh, like I said, it was from my perspective, but I wasn't the one in the shock trailer busting my butt. But from my perspective, it was, I had a great time. I think our Ryan Clark did his his usual by the numbers thing or whatever last night. I read some of that, and I think it was five hundred and five races or something like that. Wow, three thousand laps. <laughs> it's like you know, you don't even think about it until you hear them numbers, and you're like, God dang, that's that's it's amazing, insane, man. It's just unreal. Well, I mean, you know, you have a thousand cars over the course of seven days, you're liable to get quite a bit going on but no it was definitely a good time I, I really had a great time so uh that axle checker that, that that's a neat new tool you guys come up with um yeah i didn't we, i didn't bring that, that one with, i brought this one with tonight oh that's pretty cool yeah that's another great tool you came up with yeah the whole spacing marker we got this baby live on the website today so I know that uh, Nicole and Austin are, are working on getting <clears throat> all the new stuff on the website and ready to rock and roll. And uh, yeah, did you get to play with the axle checker? Yeah, I played with it a couple times. I, I think when I actually had time to come over, you were busy doing something else. Um, that deal's pretty slick, and you had that one axle that was just slightly bent, which by looking at it, you would have not known that it was bent. But when you put it on that machine, or on that roller, it definitely does. And I mean, for seventy-five bucks, that that I mean, that's just something. Anytime you bend an axle tube, you gotta check the axles or any of that type of stuff. So I'll let you give your sales pitch on that deal. Well, the other thing I couldn't believe is you know how many people don't check the twist to their axle, and we put the slot in there so you can draw the line on a new axle and watch it twist over time. I mean, that's. An axle is a consumable, just like a spring, you know, right. I mean, that, that's providing the grip to the racetrack. And that's, I guess, why Strange makes the cool ones, right? So it's, you know, metal is, metal has a lifespan. It's going to get twisted and, and mileaged out. And, you know, maybe if your car was brand new and it was really good for 10 nights and your axles are twisted in half, maybe that's, maybe that's part of the fade in the race car. But I would definitely have that on my schedule. And, talking to people all week there's you know i 95 percent of them have never even looked at the twist of their axle they just no assume it's you know gonna last forever but definitely a consumable i mean not on a you know i come from asphalt super late back in the day where we were twisting them things three quarters away around you know the the 604 on dirt you know you're definitely not going to twist it nearly that much but still something that needs to be logged in your maintenance uh maintenance log for sure yeah you know, that tool is pretty slick. I I, I I told Austin, I said, make sure we go home with one of those. Because, I mean, we roll it on the bench, but that doesn't tell you much. Yeah. Um, Frank's got an IMCA Sport Mod, 400-pound front springs on a dry, tight on entry, ways to free it up. Well... That's that's a relatively soft soft front end, in, in my opinion, for a sport mod. Um, you know, we're at a pair of five hundreds. Um, you know, it, it would lead me to believe that it probably rolls over quite a bit on that right front, which in turn tends to unload the left rear and load the right rear in, in time, which is going to make the car. Uh, tight side bite wise uh, you know you could mess with your panard bar um, once again put a little bit more left rear bite in the car with those with those type of front springs you might have to run a little more left rear bite in the car anyway because you're going to lose quite a bit once you get uh, you know when you get in dynamic and uh you know, if you're if you're not running a lot of bite, when you lose it, it's it's gains bite on that right rear, which is side bite, and that's going to make the car tight. 
Uh, Jeffrey, sport mod, advantage to the longer left trailing arm. Well, here's my theory on that, Jeffrey. I can run massive angle on it with a longer bar, and it doesn't try to hook the car so quickly in the middle of the corner. The longer bar gives you more straightaway traction, but it doesn't load the car so fast. When you get in the corner and you set the car and you, and you hit the throttle, that longer bar allows it to delay just a little bit to the point where it doesn't hook it so hard that you end up with a throttle push and, and shoving the nose. So that's that's my opinion. That's why we always run a longer left bar than the right bar. Now, if you're on a racetrack where you need instant traction and the car's pretty free, kind of a hairpin type corn, corner where you're real tight corners and you got to drag rates off, uh, that shorter left rear bar, the 16 inch bar will definitely give you quicker traction it doesn't last as long but it'll give you quicker traction uh, zach how do i set my droop with my sliders on the rear end you're gonna need more information right um I'm thinking, Zach, we might need a little bit more information. Um, th how do I set my droop with the sliders on the rear end? Um, well, you still, I mean, the droop's still going to be basically X amount of inches. And depending on where you want that droop at, when the car's all at dynamic, right front, you know, take your load stick and, and and use that to clamp the right front down and jack up underneath the seat till you get your left rear almost off the ground. And then you can kind of regulate your droop number depending on what angle you want that left trailing arm. I don't think it would make any difference if you have the sliders on the rear end, unless there's some part of the equation that I don't understand in this question. Dan, I always thought when the right rear was slipping or hot, it needs to be need need to stiffen the spring because it's one that's slipping thrust, not hooking up. That's very true. I mean, it's that's what, what I you know. Unless it's a situation where you kind of got to analyze the fact: is the car rolling on the right rear and loading the right rear real hard, causing the heat? Because you know sidewall if you're really hard on the tire sidewall will actually create a lot of heat just in the flex of the sidewall but you're right dan in the fact that if if the tire is spinning that's going to create a lot of heat and then that means basically we need to feed the heat you know putting a stiffer spring in there cutting down on your left uh your amount of left rear bite in the car things like that because uh, it's definitely so yeah but that's a good point i'm glad you mentioned that dan because it just you got to kind of analyze what the car is actually doing if it's laying over and flexing the sidewall you know i, I know many of you have stood on some catwalk somewhere you know i watch these cars to the point where well like at the school we have that one video of robert's car where that tires moving about three inches just on in the span of the rim and and that in itself the sidewall will create a tremendous amount of heat in the tire also uh travis says do you run a limit chain on the right rear why or why not um definitely run a limit chain over there um you know, and why you would want to do that is because you, number one, of course, if you've got an underslug, but you want to you want to set that chain so that you can regulate how much height the right rear gets to. So you you set your uh, upper link like on a four bar as an example. You set your upper link, and it's at eighteen degrees. You want to make sure that when the car comes up off the corner, that you're limiting it to a point. Um, what's your opinion on that? Chain yeah, the right, 
Yeah, definitely. The right rear, uh, it's a touchy deal. Uh, you need to you need to be careful. Tighten it up is more grip, but if you get it too tight and you go through a hole, then you're going to hit the fence. That's something we learned a long time ago, but definitely traction there. You kind of don't want the right rear spring to come loose. You want that right rear spring to have tension on it as you're climbing the bars going down the straightaway, and that right rear chain is what times that out. So the tighter, the more uh, the more grip you're going to have. But if you get into some rough track situations, you're going to want to have that baby opened up so that you got plenty of of uh, chain length from ride height, like inch and a half or whatever, and just kind of tune accordingly, very carefully. Um, Robert, so my Skyrocket Eldora car is a three-link car with the left spring in front of the axle, right rear spring is on top of the axle. J bar with a 24 inch bar with a biscuit. So good in heat race and on tacky racetrack, what changes would I make to for the feature on a slick racetrack? Um, well, put a little bit more angle in your uh, J bar. Uh, that's definitely one thing to consider. Um, Pull bar's too short. Yeah, pull bar is a little short. Uh, I, I would lengthen that out some somewhere around 28 inches, uh, 28 to 30 inches. Uh, pull bars, you know, depending on your angle, but you know sometimes the, the flatter one gives you a little bit more traction. It's not as quick a traction, but it gives you traction longer. Um, that's an Eldora rule. Okay, so you got to run the 24 inch with a biscuit. Um, you could try uh, taking, a, depending on how much preload you have on that biscuit, you know, and of course there's different biscuit combinations you could possibly try and Chad can explain them to you because he knows a lot more about that biscuit stuff. You know, there's different biscuits a guy could try. Uh, yeah, is there a rule on what you can run for a, for a pull bar? That would be a question. Spring, pucks, there's, you know, every combination known to man. We just debuted another one at Super Nationals. Oh, yeah. That thing was pretty slick. Yeah. So we a new new one that takes a two-and-a-half-inch diameter spring instead of a big five-inch spring, six inches long. It's still back to the old theory from... When we built that speedway bar, kind of like the spring you have, you know, the spring in your bar is four inches. You know, why do we need a huge, massive spring when we're traveling an inch, you know, inch and right. a quarter? Uh, you can run solid, but no spring. Um, oh, so that's a solid pull bar or just a biscuit? No, it says you can run solid, but you, can, but you can't have a spring. You can have, yeah, you can have a biscuit in it. Then it would be a biscuit bar combination, and then I guess it would depend on how heavy that car is to to base that. Thirty seven hundred pounds. That's thirty seven hundred. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So that's going to need quite a bit of pull bar because it's a, a heavier heavier car. I don't know what the horsepower and tire are, but I don't know. You'd have to basically rate the combination you have and see what kind of travel you're getting now with that, and then you know, kind of do some analyzation and. Thirty-one. Yeah, I'm sure we could figure it out. You know, based on what you got there. I don't know whose pull bar you got in there, but like I said, there's, you know, pull bar is a, is all about imagination, but it's all about also longevity and not having to work on it all the time. And you know, there's all kinds of, of cool things you can do there, but some of it doesn't last at all. So it's you know, we try to base all our stuff on, and so does Bob on things that last, and you don't have to work on constantly and change the biscuits every night yeah that gets pretty old pretty quick there's enough things to work on let alone that um okay before i get too far out wayne how much rear steer is too much for a modified starting out you know my rule of thumb is three inches no uh, you know, the other night on Jake's car, we, we tried uh, a, a, a different bracket on the, on the rear end, and it tightened the right rear up quite a bit. So we ended up having to increase his um, steer quite a bit more. 
Uh, in fact, the, the one car that we put that on, we increased the steer so much, it cut the right rear tire like a saw. It, it hit his door or hit something. I don't know what it hit, but he came in with a flat tire. He says, man, it's good that tire went flat. <laughs> and, uh, um, but anyway, uh, so three inches is kind of where I always start at and then kind of tune the car from there. That, that's a very good part. Um, is your Furland is your Furland car worth going to if you run a late model? Well, in reality, what we do on a modified Furland car anymore isn't much different than the late model car. I think there's a lot of great information um in that class that i think would definitely benefit a, a, a late model guy it is not late model specific but all the four link stuff i mean you know you deal with more late model guys than i do chad yeah i mean the class is you know a lot of the stuff transfers over four link is four link j bar is j bar you know uh pinion angle we we touch on lift arms a little bit and you know, caster camber toe, bump, all that stuff, you know, for the most part, race cars, race cars. So, uh, you know, some of the weird stuff that the late models do, we don't get into a lot of bump stopping. I don't know if you're an open car or if you're a 602 or four creator, but, you know, I would say definitely it's, you know, you're going to learn something for sure. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, which, which in your opinion is better, a stiffer right front spring or softer? both with the same three inch number with the stiffer spring my car sits lower as it does need as much static load to get the three inch number but the softer right front spring needs more static load to get the three inch number but raises the car up so much i feel it struggles to get over on the right front as the car's leaning on the left leaning on the left at right height. Yeah, it's a massive roll center change. Yeah, I, I would say that's probably the soft, true. The soft spring was really cool when we could have the shock limited out and wind it up. When you, right. when, you have to, when you try to run a soft spring and you got your right height an inch high and then I mean, the roll center starts almost another inch higher because you're moving, you're moving all the control arms, you're moving it to the right, to the left. It just, it, you know, I understand we want to have a soft spring and it's a trend and whatever, but you killed the race car instantly because you moved the roll center so much by jacking the ride height up. So definitely a stiffer pre yod spring is way better than a softer jacked up in the air, not going to turn because the roll center is all screwed up car, in my opinion. Now, now if you're... If you're at a, you know, with a sanctioning body where you can actually preload against that shock, or if you can run a right front chain, then that three inch, you know, that softer spring is a definite advantage. But like yeah. Chad just said, what happens is, is you get the car ends up getting so high that, you know, nothing, none of the front end geometry works together anymore. Uh, Joel, weird question. What's your opinion on running a short right rear spring or go to a softer 13-inch spring and just up the wheel load? This is on an IMCA-style stock car. Well, we've tried that, and that softer left rear spring with more load has its advantages in certain situations. I'm not super keen on running an 11 inch spring on a stock car that's got a high center of gravity to begin with. Uh, I think there's not, I don't think there's enough spring there lengthwise to do the job that you really want it to do. But back to the softer spring with more load on it, uh, we've tried that and, and that has its magic moments at times but it can be a little inconsistent also. Um, it's one of those cars that's going to tote the left front probably. Um, and it's going to have all kinds of side bite. Um, you know, in fact, 
that, that's kind of what we experimented with on uh, McBurney's stock car this last weekend uh, was a softer spring with more load in it. And then we got to the point where the rear end was out sticking the front end so much better that we ended up having to put a, well, basically we ended up having to, we took a right front shock and put it on the left front to tie the left front down so that it wasn't loading the right rear so hard. And that made the car good. I'm not saying that that, that wasn't uh, a situation, but it, it's, it's another one of those deals where just that change you might need to make a couple, three other changes, like left front shock change would be definitely one of them um, to make that work. But you know, it was it was fast. Um, you know, I think Jake would have qualified for that stock car deal if he wouldn't have gotten that wreck on with two laps to go or four laps to go or whatever it was. But it definitely will try to tote the tote the left front a little bit. So what other new things did you debut at the? Well, you took Sigma. another one home. You took another one home, the cool bump steer machine. Yeah, I did. You did. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I put it. I put it in Bobby's truck. <laughs> oh. Apparently, you didn't play with that. Uh, no, I didn't know nothing about it. Yeah, the boys took a bump steer machine. So Brandon and, and Bobby, I think we're scheming on on working on that. So, but we debuted a, a new bump uh, bump steer machine. It's digital and has an actuator, so it runs the suspension up and down. And that's another thing. Talking to guys all week is a, it's kind of surprising how many people don't check their bump steer. You know, I mean that's it's often overlooked. And just because your just because your chassis builder says your right front takes a one inch spacer and your left front takes a one and a half doesn't mean that the Asian kid that made the center link did a good job drilling the holes. I mean, you gotta, you really gotta go over your car and make sure everything's right yourself. And, and, uh, you know, just because your chassis builder builds you a good baseline doesn't mean you need to, you know, assume that that's correct, especially with stock steering components, like most of the cars are running, you know, I mean, uh, if they could let us run a center link that was adjustable, it'd be pretty cool, but that's not OEM. So. Right. Yep, yeah, nope, that's for sure. Well, that's good. I got those fancy setup plates that I haven't really used yet, so we can use that with that bumpster gauge. Oh, that'll be awesome. Um, let's see, thoughts on a right rear coilover versus slider and the shock ahead of the right rear uh, four link modified. Well, I still kind of tend to lean to, towards that coilover just because of the fact that it's one less thing to maintenance. Uh, I know Chad builds sliders, so I probably shouldn't say that, but the, the coilover, you know, the coilover just, but the, the downside to the run into coilover versus the slider is it's a, it's a pain to change shocks. You almost have to have another, if you've got a different shock combination to do it right, you really have to have another coilover kit and another spring, and it all needs to be set up to whatever your shock combination needs to be. So you know, you're, you're still not saving any money. Uh, you know, just a, what's your opinion, Chad? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely whenever if you put the shock behind or the spring behind, it just it falls and wheelies and takes so much more spring rate to do what you're doing on the front. and. I really like the indexing into the spring in the right rear, just because we want to build that, you know, that center and exit traction with the with the with the indexing instead of making it fall and wheelie. And I mean, there's guys that are running and are fast, but you know, I, I'm not a fan of it. Um, yep, yeah, I I would agree with that myself. Uh, Joel says, "Okay, that makes a lot of sense." Um, I was on an 8-inch 250 and thinking of going to a 175 13-inch with a 2.5 drop cup, drop, drop wheels cup to make the car think it's a shorter spring. Um, I think that would make the car more consistent. Am I right or wrong? I, I would agree with you, Joel. I, I think I, I like that right rear drop cup because that gets the spring table down there. At 175, um, that's not a bad rate spring. 
Um, but you're going to want to put a little load in it because otherwise, you, you once again, even with the 175, you, you might need to talk to your shock manufacturer on, you know, possibly building you something a little different for your left front that's going to tie the, you know, kind of tie the car down a little bit so that when you get into the corner and you hit the throttle, it doesn't pop the left front up, you know, the Ad, the old adage was most shock builders build a, a left front shock for a stock car that's a pop-up shock, which means it's like a five on compression and a three on rebound. The problem with that soft spring, it pops it up too quickly, and then that's the one that's going to tote that left front, and, and, and it's going to get an immediate drive, immediate push when you hit the throttle. And and so you gotta you know you gotta be a little careful. 175 is not too soft, but you're you're on that verge. But you you are right on your your what you're thinking. I would definitely do what you said. Um, on the hobby stock, what's your opinion on 11 inch spring versus a 13 inch spring? My driver said he felt like he lost drive with the taller spring versus the shorter spring. Well, that's a great question. Um, I don't know why he would lose drive. The only thing I could say is if you went to the 11 inch spring on the right rear, you changed your spring table, which in turn is going to give the car more side bite, which in turn is going to make it have more drive because uh, the car is going to feel tighter and, uh, and hooked up more. Um, that's what I'm guessing would be the case. Uh, the, the taller spring uh, kind of resists a little bit of roll, where that 11 inch spring allows it to roll a little bit, a little bit more to the right rear. If that's the shorter spring on the right rear, um, Vince, what happens when the steering maxes out where the tire hits the frame? all the way to the left or the right, does the bind in the part that the frame snaps, frame snap ring off? Oh, is that about that upper A-arm? Oh, yeah, I bet that is about the upper A-frame. It could be. Yeah, if you're, if you're maxing it out and, and the tire's hitting, it could be stress on that upper for sure. That's a good point, Vince. That's that might be part of that for sure. Yeah, I, I would bet that's the case. Uh, maybe put a, restrict that a little bit. Maybe put some sort of a stop someplace if if the rules allow it uh, to put some sort of a stop so it's not hitting the frame. Because of course, when that tire hits the frame, it's going to twist the suspension, uh, and that would automatically make sense. Yeah, that's a good point, Vince. Uh, I bet that's exactly what's happening. Um, Greg, what do you all think of the soft left, soft left rear spring versus the stiffer left rear spring? Well, Greg, it kind of depends, of course, on what class of car you're running. Um, you know, the softer left rear spring definitely has uh, has some consistency advantages in one aspect, and, and what I mean by that is. You preload that spring quite a bit, so when the car goes into the corner, you don't unload the spring as much. Uh, we're back like when we could run a 16-inch spring on a sport mod, as an example. Uh, the cars, you can keep a little bit of load in there. What happens is, is with the shorter springs, you get all this gap in that spring, and then all of a sudden, if you have to get out of the throttle and you're not trail braking the car, the car is going to fall down. It's going to steer to the right, and that's going to make it a, a, a big situation. As far as how it makes the car think, you're still taking and you still have a certain amount of load with that spring being compressed, and it allows the car when the car rolls over. I think it gives the car a little bit more sight bite. Um, I don't think it has as much traction off the corner. 
but I think it has more speed in the middle of the corner. Getting in and through the middle, I think you carry more momentum, which is going to make you feel like it tractions up off the corner more. And so that's going to be the feeling that you're going to get on a sport mod. That would make sense. Um, I know there's guys running 100 pounders, 125, 150s. Um, and that seems to be a trend going with that lighter spring. So with my left rear spring mount in front of the axle housing, the bottom of the spring, it may be a little higher than the bottom of the axle tube. Running a 16 inch spring and a 13 inch rear spring with the left spring mounted so low, my spring cable is lower on the left side, maybe by three inches. Any thoughts of trying to correct that? Or would you, would it even matter if the left rear spring does come loose and dynamic? Well, it would be better to have minimum amount of looseness in it. Um, it, it you know, there's, with the rules that we have, sometimes there's not much we can do about that. But um, if you can run that 16 inch spring, I would still run the 16 inch spring. I'd rather see the spring not come off under dynamic if you can help it. Uh, I, I think the the result of corner entry, you know, you can, if, if your spring table is not just perfect, you can kind of adjust it. You move your weights a little bit to the right. You can still do things to get the car. It's not optimal, but you can still get the car to kind of function. What's your opinion, Chad? Yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much spot on. I, you know, spring table's huge. You know, if you got it lower on the left, you almost got to figure out a way to get it higher. Yeah, if at all possible, I, I would definitely try to get it higher in the car. Your performance in the, of the car is going to be better. Uh, Robert says, if I preload, my deck height is too high, LOL. Well, then I changed my deck. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you, I mean, you, you know, once again, there, you know, there's there's always an opposite and an equal reaction, an opposite and an equal reaction to everything you do. So you got to look at the opposites and how they actually affect everything. So, yeah. Taylor, how much split do you recommend for front springs on a stock car? Um, Depends on the racetrack conditions and what you want the, the race car to do. Um, we normally run a 200 pound split with the heavier spring being on the left rear or left front, I mean, because the left front on the stock cars, they tend to lack a little bit of side bite in general. So by having a stiffer left front spring, helps the car be a little bit more snug getting into the corner. Well, we got about uh, 10 more minutes here. If you guys got any other questions, uh, any other thoughts? Is that a race car sold? Did you sell that sport mod? Well, we would have definitely sold it for sure if it was black. And if I could get black aluminum to, to change it to black, the guys on the fence uh, on a white car, and um, don't they wrap them anyway? Mike, that was my comment to Bobby was, you know, we got a couple guys he can contact that can make that thing black, no problem. And uh, so I haven't heard no more, but the. The one guy of Arizona sounds pretty interested. I mean, he's uh, definitely pretty interested. And, of course, it didn't hurt when Taylor ran real well the other night. I mean, she should have ended up third, but she ended up fourth and got past right there at the flag. 
But she had a great weekend. I mean, she, you know, boy, drove a hell of a race in that A qualifier on uh, Tuesday night. And uh, I was pretty proud of her. She did a heck of a job. I was, I was very impressed with the job she did. She looked, she made us look good. Yeah, I talked to her dad. That's what I told her. I said, or told him, I said she made a couple mistakes, but she didn't. She didn't let it get to her. She got right back on the wheel and, and drove her ass off and, and got it done. So that was cool. Yeah, and then, you know, running at thirty laps up front. I mean, she hung right with those guys. I mean, it was it was pretty good. Uh, let's see, Ryan, pull down rigs. We're spending the money to go to. Um, I myself have never actually used one. Um, I think I'll let Chad chime in on this one. You might know more. Without data acquisition for the racetrack you're going to, the pull down, pull down rig doesn't do anything for you. I mean, you need to have the the loads and the numbers that they're that you're seeing at whatever racetrack you're going to uh, to simulate. That's if you don't have that acquisition, you might as well not have a pull bar or a pull down rig. I mean, so. I mean, are they learning stuff? They're definitely learning stuff with the with the pull down rigs, but the first step is getting the data acquisition. So you're not just pulling the car down and you don't know really what you're looking at for each racetrack. So you got to go get data at every racetrack that you run at, so you know the loads that you're experiencing uh, in the corners before you can actually learn what you know what you need to learn on the pull down rig. Yeah. Um, Col Colby wants to know how much preload on a 100 pound left rear spring in a USRA B mod? Uh, I would say two inches, two, two and a half inches would be what, what I would recommend for preload on that 100 pound spring. Uh, Bob, on a stock car, the location of the rear springs on the housing, front, center, rear housing. Um, we always run the left one in the front and the right one in the center. Um, we've tried uh, the the right one behind, and, and that almost it kind of goes back to like when we used to run our modifieds with the left spring in front and the right spring behind. It gives you a ton of traction, but the problem is it's that transition in the middle of the corner where it gets a little too tight, and so it makes it inconsistent. And the thing that you know, the race is won in the center of the corner. Phase two of the corner is, is where the race is actually won. So you've got to be so spot on there that it definitely is important uh, to make sure that the right rear doesn't have anything to do with it. You know, that being on top of the housing in the center works really good. Uh, Sandra says, Chad's new, Chad, where can we get the handle that was on Rex's New scraper Saturday. Well, our our buddy Rex turned seventy, so we had a we had a birthday party for him at the on Monday there on Manufacturers Row and got him a cake, and then I had to make him a cane, so I took a mud scraper, and that's actually a lift handle. We we screwed a lift handle into the mud scraper, so we had a nice little handle. But I mean, it actually is not a bad addition to the mud scraper if you got some heavy stuff and you really want a handle to push on. So. Uh, so there's another use for the engine lift handles. When you're not lifting an engine, you can put it on your mud scraper and have an, an extra handle on it. There you go. And then you can even get that trick new bracket that mounts that thing so that you can hang it on your wall. That's right. I was driving home yesterday with my wife and, and kind of grinding through everything. And I'm like, how the heck did we just have an engine sitting out on manufacturer's row? for nine days and not have a pair of engine lift handles screwed in the thing. <laughs> so disappointed in myself. Well, notes for next year. Yep. I already got a half a page of notes from the day. <laughs> now, first thing this morning before everybody started beating me up with stuff and I started making some, well, actually when I was watching the cup race yesterday, I was making notes and, now this year or next year we got to get on that note thing we didn't get on the note thing in time because we were going to get new nice new chairs like chad weirs has in his booth so we'd be more comfortable in our booth and i had to i'm like well we got to have chairs so i dug out those old uncomfortable chairs that we used to have for the school and you know and, and they work 
much better than standing. My knees feel a lot better than they would have. Uh, Aaron wants to know with the uh, with preload left rear spring on an IMCA stock car, do you feel that using the softer spring, such as a 125 versus a 150, preload the softer will give you more drive? Um, I think it'll give you more side back getting into the corner. Um, and I think it'll give you the thing that I like about the 125 probably over the 150 is the fact that when you get back to the throttle, it's not so quick. It's loaded, but it, it, it kind of absorbs. It's not so throttle tight, but it throttles the car up really well. So as far as actually giving you more drive, I think it gives you more corner apex or phase two of the corner. I think it gives you more speed in the middle of the corner, which in turn makes it feel like it has more drive. Plus having a little bit more preload on it is going to try to make the car feel like it's getting drive. Uh, okay, Kobe, slick racetrack. Yeah, Kobe, that's, I mean, that, that's kind of what we've went to most of the time. That 100-pound spring works really well, but you, know, you might have to preload it two inches, maybe two and a half. Uh, once again, don't don't watch your deck height. That's the downside to some of, some of that preload like we just talked about. Um, Ronnie, Chad, when will you all your all engine stands be available? Well, uh, they're they're in stock right now. Uh, the five forty nines are on the shelf, right, ready to rock and roll. You'd have to call and order it. I don't think they got them on the website yet, but I would say probably later this week they'll be on the website. But uh, yeah, if you want to get one ordered up, give us a call tomorrow. Uh, Jacob wants to know what effect does indexing in or out of the left rear cage do on entry? So the left, the left where we like to start into the spring. So we want it to be, you know, two to five, somewhere in that range. There's guys kind of bouncing around there a couple of degrees, but you want to start into the spring on the left rear. In my opinion, when you start out, de-indexed out past the center line, the car doesn't turn into the corner as good and as fast. So I always like to not go past center on my indexing according to the direction you're traveling. So the left rear indexes into the spring, right rear indexes into the spring. So I'm always on the right rear, zero to three into the spring, and left rear, probably two to five into the spring. Um, Bill's got a sport, sport mod pull bar, degrees of angle, and how many inches up from the center of the housing. Um, center of the housing, you know, we usually go about 11 inches. Um, we, anyway, we normally go about 11 inches above the center of the housing. And degree of angle, I, I usually try to stay that as close to that 15 degrees of angle as I can. Uh, Jared wants to know, do I scale with that tall left rear spring? I didn't used to, but we do now. Um, I, I, I like scaling it. It's a little bit more difficult to scale with, but at least we know a little bit more about what we actually have. So I, I, we used to scale it like with a 200 pound spring and then stick that preloaded 100 pound spring in there and the problem was of course then we get our deck height too high and we had all sorts of other issues and so we just quit messing with changing the spring and we just scale it right with that 100 pound spring uh, do you offer just a frame body kit for the sport mod um, we can the downside, Jason, I'll, I'll just tell you, it's a simple business. Um, we get those cars from GRT, which is a 1,200-mile trip for us to go get them, and we have to stay overnight. And it costs me about a 1000 bucks a trip to go to GRT. So the problem we run into if we don't sell it with a few parts and a few accessories, it makes it uh, pretty minimal uh, but once again, if, if, if it's a situation where uh, this time of the year, if we can order it with a group of cars where we can make a trip down there 
and do four cars at one time, um, you know, we, we probably just have to give me a call or whatever and, and we'll see what we can come up with on a price. Uh, Jared on a three link, on a three link or on a slider. Um, well, if it's a sport mod, we can't have a slider. Um, if you're, if it's a, if it's a USRA car, uh, I definitely have it on a slider. Um, let's see, here. Bill, how much left rear bike and left side percentage for a flat racetrack on a sport mod? Um, usually, I still stay with that 54, 54 and a half percent left side with the driver and left rear bike. I still try to stay that 80 to 100 pounds. Uh, that seems to be pretty consistent, and, and we've had pretty good luck with that. Well, guys, looks like we're out of time. We sure appreciate all of the uh, input that everybody had tonight. A lot of great questions. Uh, we always enjoy doing this show. I look forward to it. Uh, we'll be here in two weeks, which will be... Uh, which will be the 26th. And then um, then in October and November, we'll probably do one show a month rather than every other week. And then once we get back into December, we'll probably go back to the two two times a, a month. What's your thoughts, Chad? I'm game for whatever. You're the boss. Okay. Well, I think that's kind of what I was thinking about. We'll probably do the 26th. And then uh, do the 10th of October, but then that'll be our only one in October. And then we'll do one in uh, mid-November, right before Thanksgiving time sometime. And cool. Talk about Turkey Day and all that good stuff. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, guys, again. We sure appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.